Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, this morning... I cannot uh, hear you all. What's going on? For us. Hmm. Okay, good can morning. you hear me? Um, this session will be recorded. All your microphones are automatically yeah. muted. Um, there will be no poll on this uh, webinar this time, but we may have one on the second episode of this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, you can enter them on the right side of your screen in the, um, in the question session, and we'll share them with our panelists. Uh, with no further ado, uh, let me introduce Chris Marku from IADA, who will be our moderator. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone. I will uh, turn my camera on, but uh, I will uh, probably turn it off because it may uh, take some bandwidth here. So uh, we will have uh, uh, another uh, seven people on, on this uh, panel and I'll introduce them in, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we will be talking about the uh, uh, use service of material, uh, the USM as, as we know it, and uh, uh, the LLP traceability implementation. Uh, we will uh, mention the implementation time scale. Uh, we will enter a regulatory and commercial aspects uh, that have been presented, and this is what we are trying to accomplish this uh, webinar and the series of webinars. And then uh, uh, some of the main parameters that uh, need to be uh, traced. and. Uh, just mentioning about the support documentation, and there is uh, quite a lot in the in the manual, in the guidance. And uh, finally, uh, the implementation and uh, specific cases that exist already in the manual, and we will build on on those. And then we we may we hope to have some Q and A session. There are a number of uh, speakers on this uh, uh, webinar, so uh, we will use another webinar in, in a few weeks to get uh, further into your questions if we cannot address them in this uh, session. So uh, if I can have the next slide. I think the, the next one, Geraldine, please. Anyway, we'll go. The, the speakers today is going to be Jason uh, Dickstein uh, from uh, ASA. He's the general counsel of, uh, of ASA, and we have been uh, working with, uh, with uh, them uh, closely the last couple of years. And also uh, part of ASA, um, um, part of the member is uh, Mitch Weinberg. Uh, he's the president of uh, International Aircraft Associates and they have been extremely helpful uh, to move this uh, forward, representing all the suppliers uh, in, in the industry. Uh, Rich uh, Govan, he's the chief uh, technical officer with uh, Castle Lake, one of the uh, leading uh, leasing companies that they are uh, specialized in the mid-life uh, assets. Uh, so uh, from, from a lesser start representing the leasing community. Uh, also, we have uh, Audrey Constable, a VP uh, Technical ELFC, so they are uh, exclusively working with uh, engines and uh, their uh, LLPs, so she will provide her uh, input. And uh, then we have uh, Dan Masford. He is uh, one of the uh, OEM uh, setup uh, companies. Uh, he's working with GE Aviation Materials. He's one of the uh, surplus companies uh, that have been set up, and he's the technical leader there. Mark Penson uh, is our, uh, he's the SVP Technical Services for Delta Material Services. As you know, uh, Delta is one of the uh, legacy, the big airlines. Uh, at the same time, uh, not only a large airline that uses uh, USM, uh, but also they have uh, uh, their own MRO for, for the airline and they do work for third-party uh, customers. So he can give us uh, some different perspectives. And finally, Pat Markham, 
who is uh, VP Technical Services for Haiku, and uh, he's uh, also uh, working uh, representing kind of uh, some of the uh, uh, parts, uh, smaller parts suppliers, uh, uh, and also they have their own uh, MROs in, in, in the components area. So as we go into uh, this, uh, if I can, you can see uh, that uh, while our uh, grounded fleet was uh, at about uh, 3,000 aircraft at the end of uh, last year, and because of you know the winter uh, schedule, uh, a number of aircraft were are usually grounded uh, or parked or going undergoing maintenance uh, at the in January and February. Uh, suddenly, because of COVID-19, uh, we had a huge drop in uh, in the aircraft that they were flying. That peaked uh, in uh, April with about uh, two thirds of the fleet. Uh, grounded, and we're talking about aircraft that are up to uh, about 40 seats. So smaller, uh, small, uh, some of the larger turboprops and all the commercial jets. Uh, as we are getting into May and June, these numbers started dropping as uh, uh, airlines were starting to bring back aircraft into service. However, you can notice at the bottom of the of the left hand side of the screen that the utilization which was over nine hours a day, uh, average utilization dropped at five hours in, in April, where was the, the peak of, uh, of the parked aircraft, and now it is uh, at less than six hours uh, a day. So that uh, created a, a huge issue in our, uh, in our industry, as you know, uh, and we, if, if I can go, if you can go into the next slide, Geraldine, and uh, have uh, prompted IATA to look into uh, some of the uh, measures that can be taken in order to help the airlines and the industry to, uh, to restart. So we have created various teams and we are working with a number of stakeholders in the industry from regulators, ICAO, FAA, IASA and others to uh, leasing companies to manufacturers, to airports, air navigation providers, and also to governments and others to provide financial uh, relief to the airlines that are really struggling. Probably this industry was uh, hit the uh, hardest through this uh, crisis. We're looking at the, at the system restart. We have uh, two pillars. One is devoted to the system restart and the other to the demand restart. And in the system uh, restart, we're looking at the system capability, and this is how we can make the operational aspects of the airline get the aircraft back into the into the sky. But at the same time, we are looking at the travel uh, experience with respect to biosafety. What can we do uh, to uh, make the uh, the flight experience uh, safe and healthy for uh, the passenger? On the demand restart is how we can restore this confidence in the in the general uh, public, uh, ensure that uh, some of the conditions that are happening around the world, they are pretty harmonized. So the customer doesn't see different aspects in one part of the, uh, at one airport and see something else in, in another, which creates a lot of questions and uh, has to be avoided in, in this case. And finally, uh, from a financial st standpoint, how we can stimulate the demand by keeping the air travel affordable and getting uh, the passengers on, on the planes. So part of this uh, effort is to uh, accelerate the issuance of uh, some of the material. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we strongly uh, believe that because of this crisis and because airlines are looking to uh, alternatives to purchasing brand new material that is quite expensive, uh, they will be looking at, uh, at other options that they have. And clearly, uh, the many aircraft that are going to be parked 
uh, some of them are going to retirement and uh, part outs. So they are going to provide an alternate source of uh, material for the struggling carriers and help a bit in the economic condition. Therefore, we kind of accelerated uh, the issuance of, uh, of this uh, uh, guidance. Uh, and we are looking uh, on, on this uh, LLP as the LLPs, the life limited parts, especially in an engine, that they are kind of the most uh, uh, expensive and the widely used, but also the ones that are more strict from a regulatory perspective. That was what made us uh, uh, focus in the what is called the back to birth traceability of those. Uh, and we are looking at the regulatory requirements and the various commercial uh, requirements and developments and constraints or conditions that have been developed over the years. We would like to uh, keep kind of uh, uh, a, a, or, or, or limit uh, the uh, ever growing expansion of these uh, commercial uh, conditions. And this is what triggered the uh, use, the uh, development of this uh, uh, guidance. So, as we all know, the value of the parts and the aircraft is in the paperwork, in the documentation that is attached to, uh, to all the parts and the aircraft itself. And the LLPs definitely represent uh, the most valuable group uh, of the uh, used service of material. There are numerous studies that uh, uh, for part outs, they show that uh, the engines are uh, 80 to 90 percent of the value uh, of the part out aircraft and out of that the majority is on the life limited parts. In the next slide you will see some of the of the history. This uh, effort started uh, a few years back uh, with uh, the uh, IATAS aircraft leasing uh, technical group, the former uh, uh, aircraft leasing advisory group, ALAG, and the site is, uh, is there to uh, uh, see what else has been developed. And uh, it started with uh, Cafe Pacific that brought us the topic and proposed uh, a template, a standard template that can be used in the, in the industry. And you can find this template in our uh, guidance material. It is in Excel format right now, but in the future, this is just uh, showing the fields that needs to be used. So uh, the look and feel can be different, but the elements that need to be uh, in that case, this is what we are standardizing with uh, and harmonizing with this uh, guidance. ASA has been, as I mentioned, instrumental to restart this effort a couple of uh, years ago. And today, what uh, we would like to, to do uh, in the webinar, uh, what are the objectives of this webinar, is uh, mainly introduce you the LLP traceability di uh, guidance material. Uh, the link is provided and most of you, if not all of you, have received that link already. Uh, get the chance to go through this material and uh, let us know uh, what is working, what is not. Uh, you had only a few days before we made this uh, announcement, so we do not expect that many of you, especially if you have not been engaged in this effort, uh, you are familiar with this, so we look into your uh, input because at the end of the day, it's the market that will accept it or not uh, uh, in this uh, particular case. So you see uh, on this panel today, there are different uh, people representing different parts of the industry segments and we're trying to work with uh, others that maybe have not been involved uh, at this stage to provide their support into this effort. Uh, we're going to provide you some of the highlights and the key points, and you will see our uh, panelists today providing us with uh, some uh, input. And uh, we would like to have the, uh, uh, the effectivity uh, of the beginning uh, of this document uh, starting of uh, next year. We are not going to uh, uh, look at backwards traceability. Of course, people will be looking at this. However, it will be unreasonable to ask someone to impose certain uh, guidances and, and, and standards now for parts that they were produced 10 years or 20 years ago and they are still uh, operating. So uh, we need uh, uh, 
some of the elements of this document in the next slide is we need to, as I mentioned, to frame the ever expanding documentation. Uh, mm. We'll talk about the regulations uh, that uh, they are pretty limited. Uh, and uh, we are presenting in the document the template and the electronic uh, format that would be the future. Uh, the template entry into that uh, birth document will be uh, a statement or something provided by the OEM of the part, of the specific part, and uh, the airlines and MROs and other owners will be responsible for uh, supporting, providing the supporting documentation, and then uh, we'll have the specific cases that they are presenting, presented in the guidance, and we need your input in adding uh, in those specific cases. You see eight or nine there, maybe ten right now presented, but we need your input. If you have challenges, we can create uh, on how to address specific cases that you face. Uh, the regulatory framework is very important, and with this I will turn it over to Jason uh, for his part of the, of the presentation. Jason, it's all yours. Thanks a lot, Chris, and welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for being part of this. If you're on this webinar, then you know that LLP traceability has been a long-standing issue that has frustrated a lot of people in the industry. Um, we're taking that issue on, and I want to call out two people in particular, Chris Marcou from IATA and Mitch Weinberg from ASA for providing leadership and really getting us from you know zero to sixty, uh, getting us from you know the beginning up to cruising speed on some solutions. Um, without their leadership, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, the issues that face LLPs, um, a lot of the documentation issues, a lot of the traceability issues, are. Kind of rooted in a foundation of regulatory issues that are being interpreted and being expanded upon commercially. Um, so part of my role here is to talk to you a little bit about what are those root regulatory issues that tend to be common across different aviation authorities, across different regulatory systems. Um, and with that in mind, when I was asked to talk about the regulations, I let Chris know that I'd be happy to do it. Um, I'm going to need about eight hours. He said, you've got three minutes. So we're going to go through this very quickly. We're going to skip a lot of the details. Um, but I want to at least try and highlight what are some of the commonalities and what are some of the most important differences in the systems. And because I've only got three minutes, I'm only looking at two systems, the EASA system and the FAA system. Uh, but obviously, one of the frustrations is that we need to meet the requirements really for any system that's out there. The general commonalities that you'll find across systems begin with the production, uh, well, actually really with the design and production by the manufacturers of the life limited parts. Design approval holders are responsible for identifying the life limited parts and for assessing them and making determinations about airworthiness limitations and then publishing those airworthiness limitations. And manufacturers are also going to mark those life limited parts with part numbers and also with serial numbers in order to allow them to be uniquely and individually tracked. Um, once those manufacturers have fulfilled their obligations, that information then sort of slides over to the aircraft owners and operators who have obligations typically under the regulations to know current life status on their parts. Um, and also, typically, their obligations remain current life status rather than back-to-birth traceability. But as you'll see in the next slide, back-to-birth traceability gets pulled back into a pseudo-regulatory arena as well. Um, typically, aircraft owners and operators are also required under most regulatory systems to pass LLP information on to the next owner or operator. On the next slide, what you're going to see is um, a set of 
differences between the EASA system and the FAA system. Um, and the one that I kind of want to zoom in on, actually the two that I want to zoom in on are the top line. One of the differences between the EASA system and the FAA system is EASA being a more modern system is much more focused on systems rather than discrete knowledge. Uh, under the FAA systems, owners only need to know total time and service. Under the EASA system, owners actually need a system for retaining that information. Um, the camos represent a difference between the system, but whether you have camos under the EASA system or not under the FAA system, there's still an obligation for someone to actually be managing LLPs, to understand the LLP times, and to control those LLPs. Um, you will see in the third line that engine LLPs do require um, previous life records under certain circumstances, and back-to-birth traceability really represents a mechanism to accomplish that. Um, also under the FAA system, we've used back-to-birth traceability as a mechanism for verifying current life status. Um, under uh, both systems, there is some obligation when you remove a life-limited part to have some sort of control over it. As you can see from that bottom line, the types of control are slightly different and who can remove it is slightly different. But ultimately, there is a general notion that there must be some sort of control that allows us to make sure that we're retaining that life limit information. Um, on the next slide, you'll see some real rough conclusions about this. You know, there is a baseline of common LLP requirements that we can start with. A lot of the so-called requirements that face the industry, though, go beyond these regulatory requirements. They tend to be commercial norms that we as an industry have imposed upon ourselves. So one of the challenges that this group has faced and that Chris's group has faced in coalescing the guidance in this white paper is that an LLP standard that can focus in on the minimum regulatory information that is required and can push away some of the commercial norms that don't add safety value is one that's going to get us all talking in the same language, communicating with the same information, and hopefully it's gonna make business a lot easier and safety a lot easier within the industry. Chris? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jason. I hope uh, you can you can hear me. And uh, with this, uh, I'll pass it on to to Mitch. Uh, Mitch is, uh, 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 has helped us tremendously in this, and uh, it's uh, it's all yours, uh, Mitch, uh, for your part here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello to everyone, and I want to thank all the attendees for their interest in this mission and their participation throughout the last couple of years in meetings and feedback as well as their passion um, to make change and with that i will go to my next slide as mentioned earlier lops are the most critical parts within an engine and they make up the majority of the value uh, as jason just mentioned regulations are in place to protect the integrity of the tracking of lop life and trust in the system is paramount um, we as an industry have invented multiple methods outside of the regulations to build trust in the system. Um, we've pretty much gone overboard with that. And it, some people feel there's just an apparent lack of trust in the tracking of life. So it's brought us to this breaking point. So the goal here is to regain uh, trust. It is paramount. And a trust in both the industry, its regulations, its adherence to regulations, and its best practices. And all of these are key in making change. And as we all know, we're currently under a high level of stress. And during this time, and obviously prior to this, there was no need to add to our stress, no need to add cost, as Jason mentioned too. There's uh, this additional documentation that we've all invented commercially doesn't add really any value to the safety and quality of the system. So the timing of this guidance material and the best practices has occurred 
at a time when it's most important for us to begin implementation. It does provide an overall efficiency um, and trust in the quality systems, the safety of our industry, and the LLP tracking. It will also provide efficiency in the transactions between assets, whole assets, piece parts, et cetera, and reduced overall costs. Uh, part of the feedback we've been receiving annually is there's a huge cost investment to put together commercial documents to appease everyone, and it's gotten out of hand. So I'm appreciative of everyone's participation. We'll go to my next slide, please. So as you've also seen by the panelists and many of you who are on board listening today, all segments of the commercial aviation industry are represented in, in this initiative. We've got OEM participation, airline participation, lessor, uh, LSE, MRO, and aftermarket distributors, uh, all who have been very involved and in trying to come up with the best solution, and here we are with this wonderful solution. So we're all contributors. We all agree that safety and quality are first, absolutely first. We all agree that the commercial requirements are overwhelming and, as mentioned, do not add value as currently transacted. The current conditions do create a loss of value in assets, increased overhead with all operations, and they actually bog down transactions and create massive delays and or failures in transacting um, whether engines or piece parts. So the real initiative is to get to the source of this current condition that comes up often, what do you want versus what do you really need? And the wants have outweighed the needs. Jason has done a wonderful job in taking eight hours to three minutes to show that the needs are very specific and we must control the wants to match the needs. So the goal today and onward is to challenge the excess wants and needs, get to the source, literally people, persons, or policies in each organization, and educate them using this document and our resources to the benefit of each party and the industry as a whole. So what we're asking everyone today who's participating is make a commitment, make a pledge, put your hand up and make a pledge, to educate your fellow uh, aviation uh, persons who are involved in transactions and implement this initiative. So I want to thank you again for your participation and let's start to make change today and for a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mitch. And uh, with this, I'll turn it over to Rich Coven from Castle Lake. Rich? Yes, hello uh, everyone, and again, thank you for, uh, thank you Chris, uh, thank you Mitch, thank you Jason for involving uh, Cass Lake, myself, and my colleagues in this process, which is very, very important to us. Uh, I'd just like to give the lessor perspective. I don't have slides here, but I'm going to go through a few points about how this affects lessors. So first of all, lessors are engaging really with the entire uh, market and all participants. Um, we need to manage different LLP trace expectations with airlines we work with, uh, part suppliers and brokers we may sell to or buy from, MROs we engage with, and other lessors we buy aircraft from or sell aircraft to. We've got long lease terms, which is an interesting thing. You know, leases can last 12 or more years, and during that time, records norms evolve, and that creates a mismatch between what the lease return conditions are that were written into the lease day one, and then what is the prevailing market conventions at the end of the lease when you're doing the lease return inspection. Also, you may have maintenance reserve claims that, that, that happen mid-lease. Mid Let's say an engine needs an LLP replacement shop visit six years into the lease, you're looking at the B2B trace at that point, then six years later, it's time to return the aircraft, and again, you're looking at records and with the norms of the market evolving, it makes it very, very challenging to get through those uh, inspections and have everybody's needs met. Um, also, it, it appears uh, that there's really a circle of life of, of this LLP traceability um, and a couple of key points for commercial scrutiny of the records uh, with, with airlines being really key in this uh, circle of life. So, you know, the airline is, operating the aircraft and the engines and documenting the LLP use, obviously uh, with some documentation from the OEM, from the MRO, but ultimately the airline is, is keeping the trace records. 
and they're guided by their regulatory requirements, their company policies, and also their lease agreements. So at the end of the lease, the lessor takes back the aircraft from the airline, and that's if the documents meet the return conditions. Uh, most of the time in the return conditions, LLP traceability is a, an undefined or incompletely defined term, and that leads to a lot of difficulty in coming to agreement on the form and substance of the trace during the end of lease inspection. Then a lessor, if, if the aircraft is end of life, will then sell it onward to uh, an end of life shop or you know, a buyer who wants to tear down the aircraft and the engines. Then again, records are going under scrutiny to meet the purchase agreement. The buyer will typically ask for everything they may ever need to sell any part to any possible buyer onward. And thus there's a cumulative effect on the ask over time. And then finally, that distributor will sell individual piece parts, LOPs, back to airlines. And then, again, there's scrutiny on the documentation. Does the documentation meet the airline buyer's requirements for their policy? What we found over hundreds of transactions is that there appears to be a mismatch of requirements. And, and the airline buyer is asking for things that the aircraft return team from the same airline or perhaps another airline doesn't really want to provide to the lessor. And this is creating friction, cost, delays, and ultimately more expense. So therefore, we fully support the establishment of a standard so that LOP trace and further the wider subject of aircraft records in general uh, can be judged and, and normalized. Uh, we believe it's going to bring, bring benefits to all stakeholders, uh, you know, ultimately improving the liquidity of assets and bringing costs down for everyone. Um, so that's that's the view from Cass Lake and I'll hand it back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks uh, for supporting us. And with this, I will turn it over to Audrey from uh, ELFC. Audrey, or yours? Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, everyone, for participating. Um, just following up from, I suppose, some of the points that Rich made, which I, as an engine lessor, uh, we fully um, can relate to most of the issues that we have. Um, I suppose from this document, uh, not to overplay the safety and everything else, because that is important and I think everybody's points are, are well versed. But I think if I just focus on this document and if I think if I talk to two points that I think um, that are pertinent, maybe first around the effort of this document and then secondly, the value I think that we can all as stakeholders um, get from it. And I hope thereafter when people download it and read it, um, they'll come, with their, come up with their own um, sort of additions to this. Um, Regarding effort, firstly, I see this as a very, very positive step forward, um, being a joint effort with contributions from various industry stakeholders, as we've heard from today. Um, over the years, speaking to other industry colleagues, we've had all sorts of issues between, we, as Rich said, we're in the middle. We work with other airlines, MROs, lessers, parts traders. Um, so we're in the balance and we're mixing with all stack stakeholders. Um, and to that end, I think we can all agree the level of frustration of what actually constitutes a back to birth trace. Um, and it's becoming more and more of an issue and it's becoming vexing for most of us. So this, as I see, is a positive step and I certainly invoke or encourage a standard. Um, when I look at this document, um, when I look at the standards and the documents presented, um, regarding the value, so I've tried to, over the last couple of months or even last years, I've tried to tease out how did we get to where we are, where we are? how did it happen? Um, and then we've had various kind of saying, oh, it's various industry stakeholders, they're asking for this and they're asking for that. In actual fact, we're all part of the, to blame. Um, we've all contributed in some regards to, to this, to where we are now. So now it's time to stop, pause, and let's analyze and let's, come, let's all agree to a standard. Um, and this is a great opportunity for everybody that's participating to work with this. Um, by agreeing the standard, these are the couple of values I, I think um, that I see. Uh, hopefully there'll be more. So it will reduce the time spent on additional documents and therefore reducing costs. And, and that's important in these times. 
It removes the request to create records, such as somebody wants an additional statement, someone wants on and off logs just because they want it. So what happens there is somebody in the industry will start chasing either airlines, lessors, somebody for a document to create that was never created before. Um, and that takes a lot of time. And time that can be utilized more efficiently and more effectively for us just to get on with our core business function, just get on with the job. It removes varying opinions. So this is where I think you've got convolutant over the years. So the person reviewing the trace is ultimately determines if they need something, since they require it. Then this requirement, for some reason, probably gets on a checklist. It permeates into the industry, and suddenly it's it's there. <laughs> um, so I think you know if the standard is agreed here with all the participants and all the stakeholders, then this is the standard. So we won't have this, we can stop it and we won't have this additions created the whole time and, and it's just getting pages and pages of, of requirements. Above all, it's a logic check. So if you agree to this document, you know, from birth right to operators, shops or whatever, it makes sense, it's logic, you know, and it satisfies hopefully most, most of the stakeholders. And I think it also creates a fair and level playing field, whether you are the seller or the buyer, at some point in time, we are probably both, you know, within that chain. So over the years, I've seen different standards for whether I'm selling it or I'm buying the parts. So I, I've never understood that, but we have seen different requirements. So this will stop that. It will be the same requirement, you know, whether you're selling or buying a part, LP standards should be the LP standard. Um, and, you know, first and foremost is safety. That's paramount. It satisfies regulatory and more importantly, it's, it satisfies commercially everyone involved. Um, so we know then going forward, what actually we agree on what constitutes a trace and what is the standard. Makes training easier, makes trading easier. And um, so I would encourage everyone to kind of look, download this um, document, look at it, engage with it, because, you know, we can we can now as an industry kind of set a standard, make our lives easier, and move forward uh, for us to trade to be better. So that's that's all for me. Thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Audrey, and uh, just also thanks to uh, Richard Hawk from ELFC. He has been uh, also key uh, participant in in this effort, especially in the early stages. And they have always, if you have any questions. Uh, it's always great to go back to uh, to them and ask uh, them uh, for, for an explanation. Uh, with this, let's move on to Dan uh, Mashborn. Uh, Dan has been uh, a key player in, in this effort, in reviewing the document, in providing us with input. Uh, he's with uh, GE Aviation Materials. Dan, all yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you for everybody who's joined the meeting here today. And I also like to thank uh, Dennis Futrell from CFM Materials. He's not on the panel today, but uh, he has been a significant contributor over the last two years. This has been a long path, and as the previous panelists have mentioned, uh, there's tremendous stress in the market right now with dealing with LLP. It's really affecting liquidity of, of movement of those parts, and it's really tied to the variation in the records, uh, records requirements. Uh, we've seen significant variation between product lines, for example, CF34 versus the larger engines, <clears throat> variation uh, geographically between European versus North American operators, and variation between buyers and sellers, as previously mentioned. Of course, there's also variation inside the same business, unfortunately, we've had to deal with. All of this variation is creating tremendous stress and really slowing down the process. We've had to hire significantly more resources over the last two years to, to deal with this. And uh, as of today, the parts we have on the shelf have already been pre-approved and ready, ready to sell. They're well above regulatory requirements. Uh, we have a pretty, pretty substantial standard we live by. And yet 40% of my team's time today is spent on chasing individual requests as our customer service team tries to sell a part on a given day. So again, it's creating a tremendous additional workload and stress in, for our team and external people. So again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the, the market coming together here in the next few months with a uh, common standard, and it's, it'll, it benefits all of us involved in it. It benefits the passengers in the end, 
So uh, again, I can't emphasize it enough. So we need to go forward with the standard and we uh, really appreciate everyone's participation in this effort. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. And uh, I'll turn it over to Mark. Mark uh, has seen the industry from a number of uh, different angles and uh, therefore we look forward to your input here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you for um, all the panelists and, and thank you for all the attendees today. Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting position that uh, we're in as Delta Material Services because we we are responsible for not only uh, purchasing uh, material on behalf of uh, Delta and, and our Delta MRO customers, but also in selling um, used Delta material. And if, if you look at our fleet, we have a very diverse fleet. Um, some of our aircraft are 30 years old, some of our aircraft uh, were delivered last week. So it's a uh, very, very diverse fleet. The safety of, of the airline, the safety uh, that we can provide our customers, whether it's MRO customers or our, our uh, trading partners, um, the airline uh, is paramount. And we we look at uh, the provenance of the part as being a very important piece of maintaining safety in in our uh, in our environment in our airline and 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 with our our customers. But what we seem to have moved away from, and, and I think just about everybody on the panel has alluded to this, is is any standardized method of determining the provenance of a part um which is very important i mean certainly we want to know where the parts come from we want to ensure that they are they are safe to install in an aircraft but um over the years and I've, I've been in this business for quite a while over the years i've seen the requirements change uh for you know, the documents that we associate with the part changed considerably. So when when the requirements continue to change and, and we have no standards, we find ourselves in a position, as, as, as my colleagues have alluded to, where it becomes very difficult to transact a part. And it um, it's not for reasons that the, the provenance of the part is not sound. It's for typically for reasons that I like my documentation this way, and you know someone else likes their documentation this way. And we've also seen it used as a as a method of negotiating the value of the part. Um, so the association of the records, uh, the number of records. I guess there's an old industry adage that the uh, the records have to equal the, the weight of the part. You know, the records don't equal the weight of the part, then the part probably doesn't have as much value as as the parts that, that that did meet that standard or that arbitrary standard. So what what I've tried to contribute to through my participation in this is is to establish a standard and and, and help the industry get to a standard place so that uh, to Dan's point, you know we we can uh, get our costs down in these transactions to Rich's point. We can, uh, you know, transact, uh, return leases, uh, uh, take aircraft on lease, in a much more efficient fashion, and and just in general to uh, standardize a very arbitrary um, and and very subjective process. Um, again, thanks to uh, everyone who's participating in this effort. I think it's absolutely necessary, and I really encourage, as as my colleague said everyone to read this document and to comment on this document. We obviously want to make it as sound and, and as beneficial as we can to the industry and uh, look forward to uh, this process moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, and with this, I will turn it over to our last uh, speaker, uh, Pat Markham from, uh, from uh, Heiko Aerospace. Uh, uh, Pat, all yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, and um, thank you for, for recognizing the importance of this topic. Um, 
from Heiko, I bring an interesting perspective, but actually I'd rather focus a little bit more on my perspective from the working group itself when it kicked off. I was actually uh, with Chris in some of the early discussions with Cafe Pacific on what the issue was and, and how it came to be. And I think every one of the panelists has talked about it so far. Uh, if there's a mismatch, if there's a continuing ramp up of the requirements of documentation, um, how do we go and undo that? So that's been a long process to get us to where we are today. Um, and I think one of the, the very important steps that happened early on was the recognition that everybody needs to buy into this in order for it to actually work. So working through IATA to go and say, okay, airlines are going to agree to this and IATA is going to support it and promote it. Uh, working with AWG to say that uh, you know, the less work community will promote and support this. Um, the reduction of, of paperwork to make sure we're looking at just the right things at the right time. Getting ASA on board to go through and look at the, the suppliers, the part suppliers, to make sure they're on board. Um, lots of discussions with the uh, engine manufacturers to make sure that they were on board. Um, especially in the very beginning, uh, the, the birth documents, um, there was not a regulatory requirement to issue those birth documents, so that was one of the discussions we had early on. So all of this work, it's, it's a many year uh, journey that we've taken to get to where we are. Um, but it really was about how do we make things easier? How do we look for, like Mitch said, just the what do you need, not the what do you want, and not the ever increasing set of requirements. Um, so I think that this document is a great start. Um, some of the things that I think are very important about it is it sets a standard for this is what will be acceptable across the entire value chain. Um, and another thing that is very important in it is it goes and talks about how you enter into this method of, of tracing and tracking. So you know, the, the first entry is the birth record when the LLP is initially manufactured. Um, but the, the document actually even has a way to go and say, if I have an existing LLP that's in the field, I can actually bring it into this system and there's a cutoff date for where I need to have records from there back and, and what do I need to enter into that system? Um, so it gets rid of some of the issues that uh, Mark or Dan or Audrey or Rich had talked about in terms of backward looking because it says, hey, my cut across date is supposed to be January 1st, 2021. Here's how I enter into the system. Here's the documents that I need on a go forward basis. Um, so I think one of the things that, that is really important is to make sure we, we do the outreach, we do the education awareness, we get um, you, all the people on the webinar, engaged in looking at the document, figuring out how it's gonna work. Um, I think Chris mentioned uh, we wanna have some follow-on webinars to go and, and talk about how are the actual nuts and bolts of this thing work? How, how do you fill out the form? Um, how do you transfer the information? So I think if, if we can settle on this is the standard, this is how we're gonna do things on a go forward basis, then anybody who isn't doing that will end up having to do that because if you're going to transact with um, with Mitch or Dan or Audrey or Rich or Mark, and they're all doing it, then you're going to have to do it as well. Um, and so I, I think if, if the industry as a whole gets to that point where, you know, this is what we want to do going forward, this is the standard we're going to work to, I think that'll be a, a great uh, path forward to this. Um, and this is the natural uh, evolution and expansion of the um, the incident clearance statement. Um, you know, the, the the non-incident statement had the same problem. It was continuing to expand and expand. Um, and IATA um, issued a, a standard on how to use an incident clearance statement. Um, it's a much more standard process. So this is the same thing. It, it's how do you come up with a standard that everybody can accept? This is the, the requirement. There's no additional above and beyond. Oh, I need to add this. Um, so I think that's where we're headed. That's what we're looking for. And I think uh, we can use the, the leverage of the incident clearance statement. Um, this document is referring back to it. And I think it's, it's really quite robust in terms of how do you start this process and then how do you go and continue it forward? So I'm really looking forward to having it get out there in the industry and, and getting rid of some of the um, unnecessary churn of people spending time tracking down something because somebody wanted it as opposed to somebody actually needing it. So I, I think, uh, from this, maybe Chris, we head it back to Q&A. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pat, for uh, uh, for bringing this uh, up. Also, the uh, 
the ICS, uh, the incident clearance statement. For those of you on the call that uh, uh, you may not be familiar, uh, IATA worked uh, very closely with uh, AWG, the Aviation Working Group that represents uh, leasing uh, uh, lessors, um, uh, leasing community, and uh, managed to uh, uh, to get into uh, that uh, form, which is uh, significantly uh, better and easier to uh, to be uh, used by by the industry than the uh, than the uh, the former uh, NIS. So uh, with uh, uh, this is what we are also are uh, trying to uh, work with uh, AWG in uh, and uh, SA and other industry groups in order to accept uh, to have a worldwide acceptance of uh, of these uh, uh, documents. Uh, and uh, I would like to point out that this has been a, a very uh, interesting collaboration between different parties. There are a number of people that have been mentioned at the at the end of the document that they have contributed uh, to to the work. Uh, we also plan to in the next uh, edition, which is coming not not that long from now, uh, a list of companies who have supported us because certain people have moved uh, to uh, move positions, and we don't want to leave uh, these companies uh, uh, not mentioned. And we are looking for uh, representatives, like uh, in the ICS case, and if someone has any questions uh, from the airline uh, standpoint, please uh, uh, send me an email. I will be uh, glad to help you out. If it's an issue from uh, a lesser standpoint with a leasing company, I will point you to the right person at, in, within the leasing. You can get in touch with uh, Audrey uh, on the webinar uh, today. And she is and she has been kind of the representative uh, on that uh, in, for the community. And we would like, once this is finalized, to have also uh, me and Jason from uh, uh, from the suppliers and the distributors to be our representative. So for any questions, please uh, get in touch with uh, them. Now uh, I would like to uh, go uh, back to uh, a question that has been asked. And uh, it's a very general question. Uh, it, it's about the, the implementation. Uh, however, uh, I would like to uh, go to Mark. Uh, as Mark has seen a lot of stuff, he is with uh, with a major airline. Uh, please, uh, if you can give us, you know, some hints on how Mark on how airlines can start uh, kind of trading the LLP in a more standard way. Uh, we don't want to go into the details, but also uh, as, as you are a buyer and a seller at the same time, uh, how can you, how have you been able through this time to kind of balance these approaches within uh, the airline that you're working with? I think your your thoughts will be very insightful here and uh, I look uh, forward to, to listen if you if you can make any, any comments. Sure. Sure, Chris. Um, well, well, one of the, uh, you know, we deal with uh, many uh, MRO customers, as I said, we have Delta Airlines and, and also we're in the USM business ourselves, so we transact. And, and one of the, uh, outside of establishing, you know, the, uh, the providence of the part, uh, what we found is that people um, don't have a standard which which uh, creates problems for MRO. Uh, we always have to consider uh, the MRO customers and, and what their requirements are uh, to associate with the life limited part. We have to uh, consider Delta, what their requirements are to associate with the life limited part. And we also have to consider um, in transacting with, with the world, uh, we're selling you know, PW4000 CF6 material, some of this is 30 years old. These uh, requirements, uh, these documentation requirements didn't exist 30 years ago. Um, if you recall, the NIS, I think, came up in, in the mid-90s and, and uh, then, you know, as, as the industry evolved, we, we started to package a whole bunch of documentation uh, attached a whole bunch of documentation to a part and and as i indicated you know our our 
initiative, our desire is to have a standard so that whether that part is used by Delta or used by one of our customers, or we're transacting that part as part of our uh, material services business, that uh, we don't spend a lot of time in the negotiation phase trying to satisfy a requirement for an NIS that might be from a, uh, a carrier that went out of business 15 years ago, or um, you know, with an on-off log, some uh, you know, or some arbitrary piece of documentation that really does nothing to to establish the, the quality or the the safety or the provenance of the part. So it, it's become arbitrary, and it, and with a lack of standards, it's become very difficult to manage. And as everyone alluded to, I think on the panel, um, it's also become very costly because somebody has to pay to do that work. And um, so, you know, to the extent that we can uh, establish the quality of the part without, um, you know, arbitrary standards that uh, lead to additional costs, um, I think a better up would be. I hope that answers your question, Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, also, uh, uh, Mitch, maybe from uh, uh, your end, since you've been uh, involved in this, any any final as we approach the the last minutes of the of the webinar, uh, any last uh, thoughts from your end? My last thoughts are: we have to start somewhere. We've got an excellent start. Um, I've had a handful of well, had a handful of individuals um, talk about this won't never be, but through experience and working with the SA and the power behind it, we do make change. And with everyone's support, as we've seen today, change will occur. We just need to participate and welcome it and start with baby steps. And I really, truly believe this will uh, make a big change for all of us. And uh, I thank everyone again. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mitch. Uh, Jason, from your side, any anything you wanted to add? Well, you know, we've talked about the fact that there is a strong likelihood that this is going to be able to save money. It's going to increase liquidity. Um, it's going to be a net good thing for the industry. Um, but at the same time, I think there has to be a recognition that implementing any change costs money as well. We all have... Um, IT systems that are already in place. Um, so I think that one of the impediments to making this happen is going to be that cost. And I think it's going to be very important for us as an industry to communicate the savings that are possible with this sort of standardization um, and the way that those savings are going to be a net positive return on investment that far exceeds the initial IT and systems changes that uh, are going to represent the investment the companies have to make. Um, I've been involved in a number of documentation related initiatives and that cost is always on people's mind um, and I think it's going to be very important for us as a community to continue to push the fact that the savings, the long-term benefits that we're all going to get out of this far exceed the investment that we're going to have to make as we migrate into this system. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, all of you who participated. Unfortunately, we're running out of, of time. Uh, your help uh, and your assistance has been really, really great, uh, not only today, but uh, throughout uh, throughout the time. Uh, also, I would like to thank everybody who has been involved with uh, uh, the, this, publications, this publication. Just uh, uh, to let you know that uh, I've received a number of comments uh, with specifics in the document. We will address uh, all of them. Feel free to send me any other notes you may have. Uh, also, I would like to point out that uh, there are uh, a couple of people so far who have volunteered to look into the uh, uh, landing gear uh, LLPs because they are also an important uh, part of the of the equation in the LLP traceability, as this document addresses 99% uh, uh, 
engine related LLPs. So we don't want to leave anyone uh, out of this. So that will be addressed in a future version uh, of the document. And thanks to those who have volunteered to help us uh, out. Again, I would like to, to thank uh, our panelists uh, today uh, for uh, helping this, Jason uh, and Mitch uh, from uh, ASA and uh, IAI, I, IAA, uh, Rich uh, from uh, Castle Lake, uh, Audrey from ELFC, Dan from uh, GE Aviation Materials, Mark from uh, DMS, and Pat from, from HICO, and also Geraldine, who has been uh, helping us in setting up the logistics of this webinar. Thank you to all, and you will find the link to this in, in the next uh, couple of days uh, through an email. I appreciated all your help. Thank you.